Welcome everybody, thanks for coming out. Um, so tonight we're so fortunate to have Bob Baker with us, the Chief of the Fire Department in Conway. Um, Bob is the rare speaker who really needs no introduction. As Conway's fire chief for 40 years, it seems like everyone except the very newest of arrivals knows him. Um, his family legacy of firefighting in Conway now extends to four generations. There's a nice article in the Reporter about that a couple weeks ago, maybe. Um, and I hope some of those generations are here tonight. Uh, this is an opportunity to hear about his experiences leading the fire department, but it's also a chance for all of us to say thanks to him for all these years of service. Um, something a lot of people don't get a chance to do for your years of uh, skilled and dedicated service to the town. Um, so thank you and everybody please give a hand to Bob. Uh, thank the uh, Society, uh, Historical Society for inviting me tonight. And when they contacted me about putting on a program, they asked me what I would like to put on for a program. And I thought about it for a while and I said, wouldn't it be nice to talk about the past, the present, and the future of the fire department? The way I see the future would be. Um, so I put this program together, a little slideshow for you. Uh, I hope some of you don't get upset about some of the earlier pictures that are in here. <laughs> you, don't look, you don't look quite as young as you did back then. Um, including myself, <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll have a few good laughs, I hope, and uh, I'll start off by the sign you see up here is our emblem that's on our shirts and jackets. That's the old 1852 hand pumper in the middle of it. That's our fire department patch. And the first slide we'll go to is, right here, this is the 1852 hand pumper. The hand pumper uh, was purchased by the town of Conway in 1852 at an annual town meeting, and it was purchased with tax dollars and donation money from the residents of the town of Conway. It was the first piece of fire apparatus equipment that the town ever purchased, as far as we know. Uh, it's classified as a hand pumper. And there was an earlier piece, I think, we've heard people talk about it wasn't owned by the town, it was at the shop across from where the fire station is now, where the equipment is years ago, there was an old mill there, and they had an old fashioned, uh, what they call the extinguisher cart, a big uh, chemical extinguisher on iron wheels, that was the first piece of equipment that they had for fighting fires. But this is the actual first piece that the town ever purchased. And so I got a couple of interesting stories about it too. This fire, piece of fire apparatus was housed in the garage at John Storms on River Street. I think it's on the second one above our store, on the opposite side of the street. He's got his cars in there now. That was an old, the old first fire station that they housed this piece of apparatus in that the fire we used back in the days. Um, one of the good old stories that came out about it was it was put left there to be housed as a fire department. But every Halloween and every 4th of July, some good old boys, they said in this article, decided to steal the fire apparatus or the fire hand pumper out of the station at night and they hauled around town and put it in different locations so it could be found the next morning on the iron. So I thought that was kind of cute, they did that. And they did that for several years and every Halloween and 4th of July, like I said, and they townspeople or the select board back in the day said, you know, this is going to be a little bit too dangerous, so we should find a new housing for that. So what they did was in the 1940s, they moved it to the cellar of the old town hall on Academy Hill Road. And it sat in the air side of an old hearse and an old post handcart uh, was being housed there for a whole bunch of years until 1950 when a town hall burnt. And all this equipment was in the basement but the firemen were lucky to save the basement from burning. And they saved the hand pumper, they saved the town hearse, and saved the hose cart. Um, so after that fire, it was removed, and, and then it was, uh, it was transferred up to where the town garage is now. They had just built that in the early, late 40s and early 50s, and they housed it up there. Um, and to go along with that story, there was an old hose cart. There's a little picture of the hand pump there first. It's kind of pretty, really, if you've got a chance to look at this 
when it's out on the parade route, you really should look at it. Because it has beautiful mahogany wood on it with all the inlaid recessed stars and stuff like that, different colors. It's just absolutely gorgeous. We've taken it to many shows throughout the state of Massachusetts and now to some other state years ago, myself and a bunch of firemen, and people just remarked how beautiful an old piece of equipment that is. Pup was designed to have, be operated by 36 men. You have 18 men on the nine men on each side of the handles, and nine, 18 men waiting in the wings to take over when they get tired from pumping up and down like this. And if you ever saw us operate it, and we have pumped water in the past, it gets tiring after a while, especially when you when you get up enough head pressure in that dome that it brings those handles to a standstill when you're shooting out of water out of a two and a half inch hose and a straight steering nozzle. It takes a lot of pressure to keep it going, a lot of, a lot of uh, energy to keep this thing going. The next one is this, it's a hose cart. The hose cart, once the, the fire took place in the town hall in, in the early 50s, after they pulled it out there to relocate it, it left town, unfortunately, never to be found again. We had rumors that it was in a, in a barn in Montague, an old tobacco barn in Montague years ago, but after investigating things, we came up empty-handed. So, about 10, 12 years ago, I'm around probably, we got a call from Dr. Cohen, who lived on Riley Road, and he said, I bought a hand car, a hose car, he said, from an auction, and he said, I've had it stored in my barn, and I want to renovate my barn. I was wondering if the fire department would like it. And it was very, very similar to the one that was at the town hall. So the Firemen's Association gladly accepted it from him for a charge, and we totally restored it. And we have that today, just like that. Uh, and it's, it's just sprinkling hauling hose, and it's just a remarkable piece of equipment. One thing that people want to realize is that hand tog and hose cart were pulled by people, not by horses. Right. Never by horses, always by people. <coughs> We've heard rumors that years ago they had a fire down close to or around Boyden Brothers Farm. And they literally ran that hand pumper from up there on River Street all the way down there so they could fight fire. And that took a bunch of good, strong men to do that. Okay, moving along here. We're going to get out a little bit out of the past now. We're going to go. These are to show you some of the trophies we have in our firehouse. And most all, these are only like one third of the trophies we have up there. But these are trophies that are all worn by that hand pump. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, in parades. The unfortunate thing is they never had hand pumper hand uh, trophies on top. You can see they're all fire trucks. <laughs> but most of them are best or most uh, oldest unmotorized apparatus trophies. In a few minutes, we're going to, this is one of our oldest pieces of equipment we have now. It's a 1951 Dodge Power Wagon military surplus that we've done all over. As you can see, it's in great shape. We keep that in great shape. That's one of our next oldest pieces. And this is just a picture of some of the members of the fire department and auxiliary that we had at one of our turkey suppers. There's a few members of our auxiliary, and that was at the 9-11 memory parade in two, uh, 2011 in the Greenfield. I don't know if you recognize any of them. That's my wife, that's my sister, that's my daughter Heidi, and that's Paul Shress's wife, and Denise Dwelling, and Jean Boyden. And this is the old hand pumper when it was on display back when uh, we had, I'll work up to this over here in a second, we Tried to, I tried to research different names for the fire chief in company. In 1945, the gentleman's name was Wilbur Fair. And in 1949, James Fitzgerald took over, which I got a lot of the information for the show tonight from a letter he sent to the fire department. In 1951, Chester Godomsky was the fire chief. Then in 1965, Ray Boyden, this gentleman on the left hand side right there in the front. That's Howard Boyden, Sugar House, his father became chief, and he was chief for 15 years. And he <coughs> did a wonderful job in the department, and he said, when he passed baton on, he said, 15 years is a long time to be fire chief in any community. 
And uh, we thought that 15 years was an enormous amount of time. Then along came the next chief. Yeah. And that's me. Somebody took that picture when we had the sugar house fire out of Williams. Uh, I was appointed in 1980, so I've been there working on 42 years. And uh, this is uh, the first ladies auxiliary. Now I shouldn't say ladies auxiliary. This I introduced in 1983. The first female members of the fire department. And this was an article that was in the paper, and that young lady right there is my wife. <laughs> and the other gentleman in the, on the left of her is Bobby Harlow. And that goes along with this rest of I couldn't get on one picture. Fire Nose Don't Double Standards, it was in the Grief Recorder. And that's Maureen Chase, Lee Chase's wife, and my wife behind her, practicing with fire hoses. And it talks, if you read the article, it talks about the ladies had to use the men's turnout gear because there was no such gear back in those days for ladies. So they were using the, using the bulky pants, the bulky boots, the heavy jackets, and so on and so forth that the men had to use. You know, it's a really good article. If you ever get the chance to uh, read it or make a copy of it, I can get you some copies if you'd like. At this time, I would like to have my wife, Helen, read a letter from, uh, why don't you come here later on. My daughter, who, Heidi, who was president of Auxiliary, wrote a short. Yeah, why don't you come with someone for you in a second? Short uh, statement they'd like to have read. Good evening. I'm Helen Baker, a member of the Conway Fireman's Auxiliary. I'll be reading a piece written by our president, Heidi Flanders, who is sorry she couldn't join us tonight. We'd like to take a moment to thank the Historical Society and Chief Baker for including our organization in this wonderful presentation. The Conway Fireman's Auxiliary was founded here in Conway in 1963 by a small group of women who wanted to help their town and the local fire department. By 1965, the organization was up and running, providing much needed resources for the firemen. Since the establishment of the organization, the group has run various fundraisers to provide the fire department with additional tools, equipment, and to keep them replenished while on calls. These various fundraisers have ranged from chicken barbecues, booths at Festival of the Hills, tag sales, and our annual turkey dinner. Along with our fundraising, we also provide holiday cards with stamps to shut-ins and run the annual rag shag parade and costume for the youth of Conway. Aside from our annual fundraising and support for the fire department, we are often called upon to assist the community of Conway when tragedy, tragedies strike. In the last two decades, we have seen this needed assistance rise. It comes in many shapes and forms. We have gathered materials and raised funds for residents who have lost their homes to fires, the tornado of 2017, and floods. We have assisted in search parties on land and in the water. Then to countless brush and barn fires, no matter what the call is, no matter what time of the day or night, we are there to help the fire department when called upon by the chief. In our 58 years of existence, we have grown from a few women to around 20 current members, ranging in the ages from 16 to 80. Today, we are the only organization of our type in the area still in use. We are often sought by the surrounding towns and are always seeking new members so we can, to, can continue to provide our community with great support. However, we must clear up one of the common misconceptions we hear from people who have not joined. Many people state they haven't joined because they did not have a family member on the fire department. The fact is simply not true. Sure, a bunch of our members have family on the force, but there is not always the case and not a requirement. Whatever your skill, talent, or desire is, we welcome you to join our group and help our community in whatever way works best for you. I can speak for all our members when I say we are very proud to be a part of the Conway Fire Department and the Conway community at large. Conway is a very special place to live. In a small community like this organization, like the auxiliary play a vital part in our community's continued growth and success. If you would like any more information or to join, please reach out to one of the members or the chief. Thank you.
Heidi Flanders. <laughs> After we, I, in the early 80s, when I appointed these ladies to the fire department, the present time I think we have five or six ladies on the department right now, which are very, very helpful to us at all times. And they are trained exactly like all the firemen are. They're trained to fight fires, they're trained to wind burning structures, they're trained, most importantly to us, I think, is how to drive the trucks and how to run the trucks, run the pumps. Because you never know when this fire is going to take place. It could be in the middle of the day, it could be in the middle of the night, it could be in the afternoon, any time of day, and you don't know how many numbers of people are going to show up. And women have been very, very helpful to us in that way. Also in the 80s, I had, uh, excuse me, in the 90s, I started a program called Junior Firefighters. And that is young children or boys and girls from the ages of 14 to 18 years old who can join the county fire department, be on our insurance policies with us, and they actually are trained to be firefighters just like we are. They do everything that we do in training and everything and so on. The only couple of things they really can't do is they can't drive fire trucks. We can't put them in harm's way. If you see them, one of the juniors at a structure fire, they're there to assist us by get equipment off the trucks, help us in any way, shape, or manner other than actually in the burning fire area, keeping them safe until they turn 18 years of age. And they're a wonderful group of people. We have set the limit for the last few years at 10, and to this very day, we're still full of 10, between boys and girls. The only time that slot would open up is one one of them either leaves the uh, organization or they uh, become 18 and become a regular firefighter. This is a picture of the juniors. Once a year, the Northfield Fire Department hosts an organizational drill for fire juniors across the county. And they go there and participate with them. And this is a picture of them the day we took the day they had training up there. Uh, they teach them all kinds of tactical fire rescue things. And you'll see more pictures of them in the future here. I'm going to show you a few pictures of the different trucks, types of things that the firemen do. This is one of our old pumpers drawn out of the our water bag, or portable pond, if you want to call it that. That's where how we have to, because we don't have many streams or rivers, no, certainly no hydrants. So we have our tankers have to dump water in this bag. We have to pump it up into the fire trucks and pump it out to the fire seats. This is our, one of our newer tankers. This is 2010. This is a picture of our guys when we went to get out in South Dakota to view the building of our newest piece of a truck, which is right in the background right there. It shows our truck being built before it was lettered and brought to county. We had to approve the purchase of it out, out there, finalize the, how it was put together and make sure everything was on it that it was in the contract. There's a picture of us outside with it, <coughs> checking, the, uh, checking it over outside. <coughs> this is a picture of the front of it, and there's a story to be told here. I thought it would be awful nice when we brought the pumper to come if we could give it a name. A lot of towns do that now. They like to give your engine, engines a name. So we had, I said, what better way to do it would be to go to our county grammar school, let the grammar school kids pick the name. So we had a contest going, I met with the principal, and we got a contest going, and she had every student in the school, 150, 60 of them, submit one name, and we bought all the names back to the Firemen's Association. And I'll, let me back up a second first. They all submitted a name, but she rearranged the name, so we never saw who the student's name was that they picked names they picked. I always saw was the name. We did not know what student got to do this because I had grandchildren, three, three grandchildren in the grand school at the time. And, uh, some of the other firemen had children in there. So we wanted to make it as fair as possible. So the firemen condensed it down and the firemen ended up picking the name South River Engine because it's parked on the South River. We thought that was a neat name. 
So when the truck came in, we had a letter, and we went down to the grammar school on one day to have the fire truck christened by the kids and show them the new name and announce the winners. And the winner would have be able to take a ride, pick five of his friends, or her friends, and ride in a fire truck with the lights and sirens going. And the, and the principal got a chance to do that. And, and some of the other runner-up kids did too. So when it come time to show the name, we had the principal come out and she announced the winner of the game, of oh, the first student that picked the name. And the name of the student was my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> Never been known to us. By any means. We, he, and my, my, well, upset my father and my son was because he hadn't said to me, Dad, he wouldn't even tell us what he picked for a name. <laughs> so, I mean, just, just sheer coincidence. And, and Kyle's here today, by the way. But he's sitting in the back row. So that's how that got his name. And we got the little boost line off and got the kids to squirt water all the truck and they just had a wonderful time doing it that day. <laughs> they felt like they were part of the community. So this is some of the outreaching we do with some of the, uh, on the fire department, some of the outreaching around town. And it's in letter and that looks kind of funny and that picture looks shorter than it really is, but just the way the picture's done on it. This is a picture of some of our, we train our firemen to do a water rescue course. We have a blown up raft with no motors, just oars, and they're all trained in river rescue. And they not only we rescue people off our river, but we are in conjunction with the town of Charlemont, because Charlemont has a lot of calls on their river, with all their river raft, rafting goes on there. So we work together and, and co coincide side by side, all of us. And when we have to go to their water rescue in Conway, we automatically notify them and they bring down the boat of theirs. And when they have a river rescue in Charlemont, we're automatically notified and we go up there. It's just as a backup precaution, if nothing else. And we have had to make water rescues before. We um, had one particular one in the middle of the night in Conway. Uh, I got the call at 10 p.m. There's people stranded on the river. There was one in the evenings in August that got cold. They got in early in the evening, pushed around on the banks with their tubes. They weren't part of the tubing company down here at all. They were just business on their own. And uh, it got dark on them and got cold. I didn't have any idea where they were going or who they, where they were, where they were. So one of them had a cell phone. They dialed 911, and so we had to put in over in Barbara's Ferry Bridge, in a crew of uh, three or four of them, and we had to get Chalamont's boat. And they started working their way downstream towards Stillwater Bridge, which is quite a ways away, which is about three and a half miles, looking on the banks for the rescued people that we had to rescue. And they they came along and. And they found them and they were freezing cold and we rescued them, got them back up to their cars. This is a call here, these two pictures here, was done at the Garden of Falls in Shelton Falls. You can see the dam here. We, this is the basket we put down to get him up on after we got him out of the boat. He was up upstream here up by the uh, dam. The guy was sliding on the dam. <laughs> Wonderful thing to do. As long as you don't realize you're never going to get hurt. <laughs> he slammed down in the water, hit a rock and the uh, fractured his arm. And he couldn't swim across the swift water to get out of it because his arm was broke. So Sean Balls got the call and they called us to assist with our raft and we went down and rescued the guy with the Sean Falls fire department and the coral reef fire department. This is another river rescue we did here in Conway a few years last year, a year before. We're off of Reeves Bridge Road, there's a water slide down through the edge of the river and a rock slide. And a young gentleman, you can't I showed you this slide, for, you can just see the back of the head, the kid's head right here. And there's Randy Williams, the police officer. These are our, Chris Herman, a few other our members. The kid is right in front of him. The kid went down and got his aunt, foot caught between the ledges and couldn't get it out. Well, luckily his father was with him. His father grabbed the kid and pulled his head above water. While one of his other children went and dialed 911. And this was a pretty, uh, Risky move to get this kid out of here because of Dougie Dean here. He is doing everything in his power to break the water flow coming down because the kid is right behind him. And he's breaking the water flow so that we make it easier to try to get the kid's foot unstuck from this rocks. And uh, we also had two juniors, my grandson and one of the other guys, were upstream with a piece of plywood 
diverting the water over here. You can see there's water over here on this other side right here. This is water that they were diverting upstream to take some of the pressure off of this here. We had to call in not only our fire department ambulance, but we called in South County ambulance. And the only way we got the child out of there was it was a miracle that it worked the way it did. They actually put the kid asleep in the water. So it relaxed the son's body. And our guys took, I hope there's no hazardous people in here. We had to take a quart bottle of barn chain oil, real greasy barn chain oil, screw it all his ankle under it. We're talking underneath the water, it's deep. Underneath there, and they were able to slip his ankle right up out of it. Because if we didn't do that, that did not work. The only alternative was to cut the leg off. Uh, how long did that rescue take? About two and a half hours, probably. Our guys, I know we can see the, you can see the face of our guys, but they um, they were totally exhausted when they got out of there. And the boy was transported to uh, Springfield Hospital, and he was released later that next day. They kept him because of the uh, cold conditions. He was in the cold water and stuff. Kept him overnight. And his father notified us that he was doing fine. And and his father called me about a week later, a week, week and a half later, he said, Chief, could you tell me when your guys train? And I said, well, they train on a Wednesday night. And he said, do you mind if I bring my son up? So he drove up to Springfield with his son, which I thought was a very wonderful fatherly thing to do. And he introduced the boy to us, and the boy thanked us very much for saving his life. In, in his life. How old was he? He was about eight years old. Yeah. Just another thing that our fire department has to think about doing. You never know what kind of cause you're going to get. This one of the blue vests under General Ant, EMT, she was in the water there too. This is another type of rescue we have to do. This is in the dead of the winter. It's severely cold. This is all ice. Very dangerous ice that could crack and drown you. If you look right there in the corner, what do you see right there? Oh, a dog. A dog halfway through the ice and stranded out in the middle. We got this call to go up on Crooked Hill, on Fields Hill. We rescued his dog one day, and our guys went out in the boat. It was a very successful operation. They went out there. The reason they took the boat, I mean, know why they would take the boat with them? In case the ice breaks. In case the ice breaks, guys see they're hanging onto the side of the rope on the boat. So they plunged into the water. They got, that would keep them from drowning also. This is some of the other training I was talking about that the juniors have up in Northfield. It teaches them to how to work their way through walls, smash their way through walls, or teaching them how to break in through metal doors. This is some of our fire training that we have once a year with our firefighters. This is a, a container that we put water in, and then we float motor oil on it, so you practice putting it out, with, like trying to put it out with extinguisher, and then you put, you know, later on you try putting it out with hoses. This is another type of fire we had on the Sheldon Falls Road at two o'clock in the morning. These are the guys coming out of this burning house. You can see the smoke bellowing out the door top here. You see the smoke here? They were coming out with their scot packs on. The house was not a total gone loss. It was uh, badly damaged, but we were able to save it. Uh, and it, uh, the guys have since rebuilt it. Uh, and that was caused by, he did the right thing, he thought. He had wood ashes that he put out on the deck, on the back of the house in a metal container with a cover on it. But the wind blew like heck that night and blew the cover off the container. While he was sleeping, he caught the porch on fire and caught and before he, the fire woke him up and was actually in the house, the fire was. Things can happen. Here's a few of the car accidents we go to. They smash off the road into trees. This one's really good, this one here. This one had three, two children and a guy in it. You see this container in the back here? He was had some big uh, masonry blocks or, or granite blocks in the back strapped on because he's going to do some work in his yard. When they hit that tree, those granite blocks went through the back window, over the head of the kid sitting there, thank God, over the heads of the driver in the pasture and was just sitting on the dash when they got there. And the car was totally destroyed. And that was quite a rescue we had that night to get them out of there. And they were all transported to Bay State Springfield. Uh, the young boy that was in the 
was that the backseat run? Yeah. He was injured the worst. Uh, we had to cut him out of the vehicle. Uh, and all three of them had broken bones and injuries, and they were laid up for quite a while. But they all survived. This is a fire on, on should be North Poland Road in Conway, where the house was just about totally gone when we got there. It had been burning a long time for somebody spotted it. This is a picture of ours our drilling at in South Air on a high, fire hydrant. How you hook your hoses up to the fire hydrant so that you can attack the fire with it, but yet you can re pump the hydrant to build up more pressure to send your water out quicker to where it's got to go to. There's some of the brush fires. This is over in uh, that big brush fire they had in uh, Ludwig, mountain fire they had a couple years ago in Ludwig. There's a bulldozer cut a path into the woods for us. This old fella sits right here, this old brush truck of ours. The way that bulldozer went, we were the only truck that could get in there because the hills were so steep. <coughs> we ended up pulling some of them in. I mean, matter of fact, these are pictured down the hill for at least two further. They were up as high as we were. Uh, we ended up pulling some of the newer ones in with us to put the fires up. We had to, I think that ended up being 400, no, 300 acres or something like that. It was put out, it was a two or three day fire. This is our most recent barn fire on uh, uh, Craig Hill Road. This barn was started by a lightning strike in the middle of the night. You can see the glow around the trees and stuff from it. This barn was pretty much like that when we arrived. I saw fast that one up because it had hay and stuff in it. It was a beautiful barn too. Originally. And this is what the remains would look like in the morning. There's not much left. And this is a camper fire over here. But that's drill, one of our drill nights. We had a camera donated to us so we could show the guys how to put them out and show them how fast a camper goes up when it catches fire. This is right by the post office in Conway on 116. Oh, yeah. You see these right, you know these marks there? That's an electric line that came down on the blacked out on the, on the concrete sidewalk actually. Burnt this big hole in the sidewalk, and you can see where the light, the arcing was dog legging out in different directions. If you were to take a shovel and you dig, if you could dig underneath these, you'd find they were all with solid glass underneath it. It actually takes the earth and turns it to solid glass from burning so much. Very dangerous type of fire. You, you, all you do is you get around and protect people from staying away from it until the light comes and you can get there and shut it off. Nothing else you're going to do about it. It's just too dangerous to get too near the fire to run. This job picture here is of our a uh, fire we had in, uh, in South Dever with a helicopter. <clears throat> we had them in Townsend one, years ago. That, that's a water bag there. And they're coming in with this bucket here. And that helicopter will lower that bucket down into the tank, fill it up with water, and take it and fly over where the fire was and drop it on the fire. This fire here is the log cabin that used to be across the street here on the corner. It's a lot for sale right now. That was where that was burning that night when we first got there. That's what it looked like. This fire was a brush fire this last summer in Williamstown. And that was taken by some of our firefighters that they left the first day to come home. Because that was so big they couldn't get it out one day. All of the area of towns couldn't get it out. This was that 911 observance we had in Greenfield a bunch of years ago. <coughs> that was a really, really beautiful dead silent parade. If you were in the parade in Greenfield, you were marching down the street, and all you could hear was the feet of the firemen hitting the blacktop. It was dead silence. The fire trucks that were in the parade were ordered not to blow their sirens or nothing. It was a dead silent walk. So like the year that me and six other of our firemen went to Worcester, and all the firemen lost their lives in Worcester. We went down for their memorial service, and the President of the United States was there. And, uh, that was the most serious thing I ever experienced in my history of my life, where you're marching down the city street that was dead, dead quiet. Let's say, locked the whole city down, no vehicles allowed in there. And I knew there was like uh, 15 or 20,000 firemen marching. And all you could hear is the shuffle of the feet on the pavement. It was really, really eerie. But it was quite a tribute to the firemen that lost their lives. Here's our group taken a couple years ago with some of the ladies' auxiliaries and <clears throat> some of the juniors. 
and some bunch of the firemen. And here's a little PR we do. <laughs> well, Fire Prevention Week. We have a yes, Sparky, the, the fire dog suit. <laughs> and this is my grandson, Kyle, he's a little guy. <laughs> and I can't tell you who's in the suit because I can't remember. And the kids go crazy when they see this guy. <laughs> I, once in a while we have him at the grammar school for fire prevention week. And the kids just love to see this dog suit. It's unbelievably hot in there though for the person wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, one of the thank you notes after a fire prevention thing at the grammar school. That the kids in the grammar school wrote, which I thought was very nice. And then we have one last picture here. This is out of our Amos. The town of Conway owns. A few years ago, it was, used to be called the Fire Department Ambulance, but for some unknown reason, when they re-registered it one year, the past ambulance directors took the county Fire Department name off of it. We're hoping that someday we can get it back on there again, but it still sets in the station side of the fire trucks. And uh, that is our, I think. Can we have the lights turned on, please? We're almost done. Okay. I want to show you some of the past, present, and future equipment we have. And I was very fortunate to see this piece first time ever tonight. Was a helmet, because I bought a couple of helmets to show you. And this is the Historical Society it has this upstairs. And this is a helmet that was back in the day that they purchased the 1852 hand pump. That was an all leather helmet, which has been collapsed now. It's just a wonderful, wonderful piece of artifact. What's it made of? Leather. And that was back in 1852. And after that, 1852, in future times, this is the helmet that back when Ray Boyd was chief. This is the type of helmets they were, thin plastic, hardly any headband in them. They were wonderful to wear. They gave you just about zero protection. But that's what they were back in the day. So I'm going to, uh, I'll pass this around if you want, or you can go up here. I don't know if you up here, I guess you can go up and check them out after. But anyway, this is a newer day helmet. This helmet weighs about a pound and a half. This one weighs seven and a half pounds. You can see the inside of it. Well protected for your head. With the shields on it, real thick. These were designed to take a tremendous hit to the head, not hurt the person wearing it. And we have, uh, lighting on this thing of the three different three different things. So very important at night that you have proper lighting when you're fighting a fire because you all know when the fire is burning it's got plenty of light. But what happens if you put water on the fire? The light goes out. <laughs> then you're standing in the dark. So you need to have some means to be able to see. And also the nice advantage of these newer style lights now is when the firemen's walking away from you at night, you never could tell who they were, where they were, or, or anything. Nowadays, they have this blinking light in the back. So that when they were walking away from the fire truck or walking away from you at the fire scene, you can tell where they are. Which is a great safety feature. Years ago, we had Fire nozzles like this. This thing probably weighs close to 10 pounds. Very, very old, very adequate fire hazards back in the 50s and 60s. And this is the newest one. This is the newer stuff. Very, very easy to operate. It comes with adjustable foam patterns and water flow, and you just control it like this. Hold How much does that weigh? What's that? How much does that weigh? This probably weighs three and a half, four pounds. This will probably knock down ten times more fire than that thing would. With less water. Less than half the weight. What's that? Less than half the weight. Less than half the weight. Less than half the weight, yes. Yeah. What kind of water pressure does it have? This can go up to about, well, the operating pressure of these is 125 pounds. Years ago, you'd run between probably 50 to 70, 90 pounds maybe, and you had two guys on the nozzle. 
These new ones, you can knock with, one guy can operate at 125 pounds. You prefer to have a backup, because if you stumble, you're gonna go for a ride. It's nice to have somebody backing up, so uh, we try to back them up, which, uh, no matter who they are, on the backup. We're in the modern, we're gonna move in now to a little bit of the modern equipment. This is a, what they call a thermal imager. Has a screen on it. And it has, it'll pick up heat sensing and show you a picture of uh, if you say you went into a burning house, God forbid, and somebody was on the floor in there. You could actually see them in the dark with this and pick up their body heat. And uh, I don't want to, you don't want to point that at somebody's eyes or you hurt them, but anyway. You probably can, oh, I don't know what it looks like when they point at me. You probably can see where my heart is. <laughs> <laughs> if I got one. <laughs> so, this is a absolutely most wonderful, useful, very useful piece of equipment that we uh, have available to us today. This little item right here today is $16,000. Oh, man. Do we, we just, paid do we just have one? 12, 13,000 well, a few years ago. Yes, we have just one. Yeah, we have just one. Does and that we also take real good care of this. We don't drop it. And we try to take the best care we can of it. Don't let me touch it then, because I dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> um, does that also, if there was a chimney fire? Yeah, the, yes. Is that it, the same thing that would detect it as a chimney fire? Look, this will register heat right through the walls, through the concrete block, anything. You can, and it'll show you the heat, the degrees too. Wow. So if you had a chimney fire, and we were worried about extension to the walls or the ceiling, you can just point it up at the ceiling and tell you the temperatures are on it. Whether you should be worried about it. That's what they use to patrol the lines for a hot spot. Right. Yep. Yep. And the last couple of things I want to talk about, we were just lucky enough to get a federal or state grant to purchase brand new 800 gun to go into our 800 megahertz radios. Portable radios. Um, I think we paid around 10%, 15% of the cost of this radio, and the rest was done with grants. Uh, these are newer style radios. They're all, they talk to you. Fire one digital. We go digital, we have analog, we have uh, private channels we can go to, we have uh, top channels we can go on, and so on and forth like that. Let's get a screen on the front, tells you everything we've done. Wonderful radios. These are radios are working right, and they, they, they work well. If you had a, they claim if you had a one of these radios in Boston, you could talk to King Kami from radio to portable to portable like you stand beside each other. That's how powerful they are. So, that's the newer style. The newer style helmets all, like these are the helmets of iron at age right now, but the future helmets that are coming out are like the spacecraft people wear. And the radio communications are built into the helmets. <clears throat> so you see, you see the primer now, they have to wear these in your pocket. And they have the microphone hooked on to somewhere that they can talk out like the police do. But the new helmets that are coming out are state of the art with all the sound system built right into the radio and the helmets. And I didn't dare find out how much they cost because they're too <laughs> These are, uh, to dress up a firefighter, lady or girl, man, or woman, I mean, once they join the fire department, it's around $5,300 to gear them up. That includes the helmets, the raincoats, the boots, the gloves, the shields, the hoods, and their fire pagers. This is a fire pager. I don't know if any of you ever seen these or not. It's gonna make a little noise. You wonder how we get our call. Years ago, the lady at that lady at the uh, telephone office, which used to be used to be next to the post office, would get a fire call, and she would start down the firemen's telephone numbers one at a time. It took her forever to get the firemen on. Then in modern times, we went to what they call a red phone system. We had five or six locations in town. <coughs> they had a red phone. The telephone was painted red. It was colored red. 
And when you called in for fire call, or an ambulance call, it would ring into these six locations and somebody would pick it up and answer it. And they had a switch that activated the town siren to alert the people. Then we got modern after that. We did away with all the phone, we went to these papers. And this is what they sound like. And if you're sleeping in the middle of the night, it'll put the fear of God in you. <laughs> Believe me, you're not going to sleep through it. That's a fast problem. <laughs> you, you, you about to jump out of your skin in the middle of the night. That's the new, new way papers come from. And also to go along with that, we've just started uh, this last year a program called I Am Responding. And it comes out over your cell phones so that when uh, the dispatch center activates these, they type in the information out, and your phone will start jumping up and down and making a whole bunch of signaling noise. And uh, it comes. Right, you're coming or not. It goes into a red screen like this, and if you look at your phone, it tells you where the call is, what type of call it is, what the address is, uh, and then you go into a location spot in there. I'm get the signal in here now. But anyway. And on the bottom, and this is what the useful part of all, I think, is. There's three different locations. You can tap on one of the three locations. You're going to the fire scene, you're going to the fire station, or you're not responding at all. So that when we get to the station, we usually like to have more than one guy in the truck, especially if we go on these mutual aid calls uh, for Rick teams or something like that. You can turn on your phone, you get to the station, and find out how many guys are coming and it tells who they are. So I think that it's a great piece of equipment that, that we use for that in the modern day. Okay, and I guess it's time for questions and answers. Anybody got any questions? And I don't know if I want to give you the answers, but... <laughs> <laughs> Phil. Sure. Gee, thank you, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I got a question for you though, and that's, you know, uh, the share with us, I mean, the, the, most humorous call that you were ever on. Oh my God. Uh, or if you can't rank them, just the top few that come to mind. Okay. Well, I'm not going to rank them. Right. Uh, <laughs> actually, none of the calls are humorous. They really are not. What you're going to see sometimes is firefighters as a fire, the more serious the fire, the more times it happens. Uh, animals call them, something like that. Sometimes you'll be driving by, you see some of the firemen joking and laughing a little bit. That's their way to handle stress. Yeah. They're not joking about the fire, but that's our way of handling stress. Because we do have some serious stress problems sometimes on, on, on situations, uh, different types of fires. And we do have a, when we have a major fire, the very next Wednesday night, we have a, what we call a debriefing. And we get all the firemen together, get everybody's involved in the call. Uh, if there's a death involved, we would call in the pastor from another fire department to come in and grieve with us in that shower wave. Uh, they mm -hmm. will stay on the fire department to put up the type of situation we put up in. But uh, my most humorous, oh. Oh, okay. uh, well, okay, that's one of them. Now, <laughs> that's that one of them. Years ago, Ray Boyd used to be chief. And Ed Baxter used to be on the package store up above the fire station where the garage is there, the old abandoned garage now. Edwards had a red phone and he was one of the members of the fire department. <coughs> Ray Boyden used to hate cats, literally hate cats, because he ran the Boyden's farm and we always had cats running to the barn. He literally retired. I hate cats. <laughs> and this lady called one day on the fire phone and said, my cat's stuck up in the tree. <laughs> Can you help me out? And he said, well, ma'am, and Baxter said, I can't help you out, but I can give you a number to somebody that can. <laughs> he goes, Ray Boyd's our fire chief. He loves cats. <laughs> and he said, whatever you do, when the yep up the phone answers, ask for the cat man. One of the other situations, I almost tried to tell you about Ed Baxter. Because he was our, our deputy force warden in town, who is a, uh, runs our deputy now force warden, and we go out, they're in charge of brush fires, when we have brush fires. And Ed was our deputy force warden, and this is shortly after I became chief. And he called me up one afternoon, Saturday afternoon, in the fall time, and he said, Bob, 
can you go for a ride with me? And I goes, why is that? He said, come on up, I'll tell you when you get up the stairs. So I'm up there, we get in his jeep, and he said, Bob, I got a call for something illegally burning on the Shelton Falls Road. He said, and I want you to know that we're going to go out there and we're going to make him stop burning. But he said, when we get there, I don't want you to say nothing. I'll handle the whole situation. Huh, well, I'm new chief. Mm -hmm. How do I go along to the same thing? We get out there. And we walk out the field, the guy's daily burning. He says, you got a permit? The guy goes, oh, no. He says, do I need her? Goes, oh, yeah, you need a permit. I get, I get, the guy goes, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, just, boy, you are in serious, serious trouble. The guy's going to know. They start to drop. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, it's your lucky day that I showed up here, not the brand new fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing right side the guy, right? <laughs> and Baxter, when he sells the guy, I'm like, what do you know? He said, this is the, the new fire chief. He is a mean guy. He'd have fined you. He'd have, you'd have, you'd have had to pay all kinds of money to have the fire department show up. It is, you're just a damn fortunate that I'm the only one that showed up. The guy goes, oh, thank you, by all means, I won't do it again, all this stuff. And then I started wagging on the head, turns around, the guy says, oh, by the way, he says, I didn't introduce you to the guy standing beside me. This is the new fire chief, Bob Baker. <laughs> <laughs> One more quick story. Uh, do you want to say something? I have a question. Go ahead. The story first. Uh, okay. uh, I'm trying to think what it was now. <laughs> I got laughing, sorry. Um, Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Okay, right. so the question so, is, uh, before 1852, how did they get pressure? How did they have fires if there was no water pressure pump? Did, 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 before they had the hand pump, it was just buckets. Wow, yeah, that's what I said. That's it. Bucket of water. Bucket of yes. That's why I was going to say, that was it. So that was a great invention. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got my last story. Okay, just bottom. Okay. One quick one last one. Okay. It's a cute little story. Sue has it. Yeah, I'll get it soon in a second. Oh, I want to hear the story. This lady, <laughs> Bill Owen used to be our deputy fire chief. He lives two houses up from the, cup, the bridge right here. He lived to him and his wife. Very sweet little old lady wife he had. She's a sort of sweetheart. She wouldn't swear for a life ever depending on it. And they had a red phone in the house. And we had a fire call one day. So we're all out putting this fire out. We fall time, rush fire time of the year. And lo and behold, the fire phone rings again. And she picks it up to answer the fire phone. And the guy says, I got a brush fire. Can you have the fire department come out my house? She says, oh, I'm sorry, sir. The guys are all out on the call. You're going to have to call back another day. She <laughs> 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 real serious about it. But luckily, back in that day when we had radios, so the person hung up, they called. Jeez, I don't know what I've been doing. They called the Greenville Fire Department. <laughs> and the Greenville Fire Department got on the ground and called and said, hey, you know, you guys know you got a little fire, a little fire in your town. <laughs> <laughs> and they handled it. Sue, go ahead. Uh, <coughs> some of the photographs of uh, fires in progress are pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Do you have a designated person who does that? No, but no, we don't. Having the record must be a very useful thing. I, most of them I've, them I've taken I have off my cell phone. Uh, the ones that are pine fire and cricket out of my granddaughter took them that night. But sometimes I get them from other people and I transfer them to my phone. And I wish I had a way to do it. This is the first time we were documented them in any series. So. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, you got one, what, yeah. Phil? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> okay, I've got one question for everybody else. I want you to answer yourselves when you, when you see what I did. This is my final slide of the night. And thank you very much for putting up my hand a little bit. Thank you.